to have a good turnout. Uh, we had a great lunch and had a good meeting with our education committees. Uh, we enjoyed having some senators in there with us. Where they were very good and had some good questions, Strand. But uh, we had a good time. And it's, real, it's really a pleasure, and I don't want to take any of your time, but to introduce this lady. Uh, I've already, she's already won good supporter here. I've really just, the short time I've been with her, just really admire what she's doing and the guts this lady has and what she's done. But uh, Michelle Ray, she, uh, we've all heard about her, and I know you've all been excited. I've gotten all kinds of emails about her coming. But I just want to read this one paragraph because I think it just sums up so much. It says, Michelle Ray has been working for the last 18 years to give children the skills and knowledge they will need to compete in a changing world. And people, you know this world changing so fast, you blink an eye and you've missed it. From adding instructional time for after school and visiting students' homes uh, as a third grade teacher in Baltimore to hosting, and I think this is the key, hundreds, I didn't say four or five, hundreds of community meetings and creating a youth cabinet to bring students' voices into reforming the D.C. public schools. She has always been guided by one core principle. And Fran, you and I have talked about this a thousand times. Students first. If it's not good for students, we don't need to do it. The thing I love about it, I said earlier when I introduced her before, she started out in Teach for America. That's where they go after the best. And I've told our colleges of education, you know, you're missing hundreds of students up there, but not going after some of these in the fine arts area the best. She started out there. She's been a classroom teacher. She, she has been in charge of one of the toughest school systems in the nation, Washington, D.C., and really turned it around. And I understand that there's a group outside from Atlanta Public Schools in the cab trying to hire. Fran was up here trying to get her to come in. <laughs> and you too. You have to too. So without any further delay, we're going to take most of the time for questions. But it's my real pleasure on behalf of Georgia to have you here, Michelle. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I really do want this to be more of a discussion so that we can actually get into the kinds of conversations that we need to have in the state to move forward aggressively on education reform. Uh, but uh, a couple people have been asking me, so what are you doing now? What's Students First? What's that all about? So I thought I would start us off by just explaining a little bit about uh, my new organization. So just to give you some background, as the chairman said, I, uh, I started my career in education through Teach for America, and I was a classroom teacher, second and third grade. Uh, in Baltimore City. I had a life-changing experience there, and after that experience where I took a group of kids who were the, at the absolute bottom, you know, ensured that over a two-year time period we, they had all the skills they needed, and the majority of them were, were, were uh, at where they needed to be, uh, I, I, it sort of struck me that if we are going to fix public education in this country, we've got to make sure that we have the best teachers possible. So um, basically with that, um, I decided to start an organization called the New Teacher Project. And back then, so this was 20 years ago, the common wisdom was that the problem with, you know, with teachers was that we couldn't recruit enough great teachers to come into the system. It was re considered a recruitment problem. And the U.S. Department of Education said, we're going to need 2 million teachers over the next 10 years. So I said, okay, I'm going to start a teacher recruitment organization. So we started the New Teacher Project. We started working with states and school districts across the country on recruiting great teachers. And what I very quickly realized was it actually wasn't a recruitment problem. There were plenty of people, both, you know, Teach for America type, people who had graduated from schools of education, and even mid-career professionals who were willing to make a career change to come into education. So the problem was not that we couldn't find people to, to, to come into schools. The problem was that we, we couldn't actually hire the best people because these HR systems in the school district were, 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 were crazy. And so we thought, okay, so I pivoted away from recruitment and I started focusing on HR systems. How do we fix the HR systems? And then as we started doing that work for a while, over a number of years, we figured out, well, it's not really just the, the, the HR systems either, because when the district overall is making these crazy decisions and uh, the HR department just has to go along with it, then you can have the best HR system in the world. It's still not going to matter. So then we pivoted uh, sort of again away from well, not just HR systems. And at that, around that time in my career, uh, I was approached by a Adrian Fenty, who was then the mayor of Washington, D.C., to run the Washington, D.C. public school district. And uh, there was nothing more unattractive than being a, a, an urban superintendent that I could think of. But then I thought, you know what, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Um, I've for you know, a long time told, looked at school districts and said, gosh, I wish they would do X, Y, or Z. And so this was the opportunity 
opportunity to actually run a district and, and the most uh, dysfunctional and low performing one at that. Uh, so I went into the system uh, over a very short period of time. We took the district from it was the lowest performing urban jurisdiction in the country on the NAEP examination, which is a national exam. We went in a two-year time period to leading the nation in gains in both reading and math, both the fourth and eighth grade level, where we were the only jurisdiction in the country in which every single subgroup of children were improving their academic standing. So we actually, and, and, and you probably read about some of these things, I was known as the dragon lady, the teacher terminator, all these sorts of things, but we were putting in place, making the hard decisions that we knew were necessary to see really rapid change. And, uh, and I thought to myself when I started that job, you know what, if we just produce the results, the academic results, then, then people will want more of them. And I could not have been more wrong because what we realized was that even though we were producing the results, because di people didn't like the, the way that it was happening and the pushback on the, you know, et cetera, that, um, that my boss ended up losing his election. And that is what actually caused me to rethink what we need in this country in order to ensure that aggressive school reform is happening. Because the systems, the dysfunctional public education system, are not the way they are by accident. Let me be clear about it. They are not the way they are by accident. There are people who benefit from systems having no accountability and being dysfunctional and not sort of, there are people who benefit from that. So the defenders of the status quo are very strong, they're very organized, they're very strategic. And so if you look over the last three decades in this country, in America, the, the education policy has largely been dri driven by special interests. You've got textbook manufacturers, you've got teachers unions and associations, you've got all these people. And the problem is that there has never been an organized national interest group that is advocating on behalf of children, right? Children is our only about that has the heft and the weight of the, t of the teachers union. So I thought, well, this is what the country needs then. So we started Students First. We started it as a national membership organization. Um, I had the good fortune, we, we, we talked Oprah Winfrey into launching the organization on her show. And on that show I said our goal for the first year is to raise $1 billion and to get 1 million members. One million Americans to believe that we need to put students first. When I came off the show, people said, you are crazy. How are you going to do that? It's never going to happen. And guess what? Within the first 36 hours, we had 100,000 people signed up. Um, right now, uh, we're, we're at much more than that, but 6,000 of those members are actually Georgians. So we have, in eight weeks' time period, we've had uh, 6,000 Georgians sign up to say, we're ready to see massive education reform in our state. Um, so what, what we need to do is make sure that we're creating the right environment so that, that, that courageous politicians who really want to push the envelope on these issues have the political backing um, of the constituents that they need to get this done. And I'm going to give you one quick example, and then I'm going to open up to questions. Uh, right now, uh, school districts and, and uh, states across the country are facing massive budget cuts, massive budget constraints. And so undoubtedly what will come with that is layoffs of teachers. Right now in this country, the vast majority of school districts conduct their layoffs by an antiquated system called last in, first out, or LIFO, right? Which means that if you were the last teacher hired, you are the first one fired regardless of how good you are. LIFO has three negative impacts. One, if you fire people by seniority instead of quality, you end up firing some of your best teachers in the district. That's what the research shows. The second is that you actually have to lose more teachers and more jobs because if you fire just the junior teachers, they actually make the least amount of money, so you have to fire more of them to make up the budget deficit. So for you as, as politicians, more of your constituents are out of work if, if you use LIFO. And the last is it disproportionately negatively impacts the, the, the highest need schools. The highest need schools in our inner cities have the largest number of new teachers. So when the layoffs come, those schools are decimated, whereas the higher performing schools with stable staffs, they're virtually untouched by the budget cuts. So by any measure, by any measure, doing layoffs by seniority hurt children and hurt schools. Why would we continue? this kind of practice. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, 
right? So if we are going to think about, which a lot of people like to throw the language around, but then they do a different thing. If we think about students first, what is in the best interest of children, then we would have to necessarily change the way that we're doing those policies. And there's two ways to do it. We can wait until every local jurisdiction decides about how they're going to do it. Or at the state level, the state can come out very aggressively and say, you know what, in our jurisdiction, we are going to put children first and we are going to make sure that when tough decisions like this come about, we're going to ensure that we save great teachers and we keep the best talent in the classrooms. And that is an example of the kind of thing that Students First will be advocating for across the country. So I'm going to stop there, uh, and, Chairman, and I take questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you had mentioned earlier when you were talking to some of the legislators um, about the dynamic between uh, charter schools, traditional schools, and vouchers to create this, this, this dynamic where the, the rising tide lifts all, all boats, yes. that, that provides a, a, a dynamic in the marketplace um, that drives achievement for everybody. Could you describe yeah. how vouchers do that? Yes. And what you, whether it's in D.C. or, or yes. otherwise? Yes, sure. I'm going to talk about both charters and vouchers. I'm going to tell a quick little anecdote on both. First of all, on, ch on charter schools. Uh, we have a charter environment in D.C. that is incredibly friendly. So charters get the full per-pupil allotment, the same that, that, that all districts do, and the districts are not allowed to skim off the top of that, full district, full allotment, plus they get a $3,000 per child facility allotment on top of the, the, the academic allotment, and they get first right of refusal over unused buildings, and we enforce it. Um, and so the charter environment is a very friendly one. What it's done is it's caused all the best charter providers to want to come into D.C. Uh, and it was interesting because we had a situation where we had a co-location of a charter school with a traditional public school. Charter schools knocking it out of the water. I mean, they're doing great. And, uh, and so the, 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 the uh, population in our, in our traditional public school was dwindling. So we were left with this decision of what are we going to do with our school? And I said, well, we'll close the school. We'll give the building to the charter school. They're, they're doing a great job. And my staff said, uh, we can't do that. She said, that, that's not only going to have an impact on that particular school, but then if you let that charter provider, because they're so good, then they're going to suck enrollment away from the other DCPS schools in the area. And I said, here's the problem with your thinking. My goal is not to defend and preserve the district. My, my, my goal is to make sure that every child in the city gets a great education. And if that charter provider is actually going to do right by that community and provide those kids with a great education, then we should absolutely do whatever we can to support it. So that's the first. The second one is we have a, a voucher program in D.C. called the Opportunity Scholarships Program. And early on in my tenure, I came out in favor of the Opportunity Scholarships. People went nuts. Right, because I'm a Democrat. So they said, you're, hey, you're a Democrat. Democrats aren't supposed to support vouchers. And then they said, and furthermore, what are you doing? You have the most to lose from vouchers. The kids will be leaving your system. The money will be leaving your system. Why are you supporting them? And once again, I said, look, I meet parents every day, parents who live in Anacostia, worst place in the, in the city, right, uh, economically. And they come to me and they say, okay, I looked at my neighborhood school. It's failing. I can't send my kid there. Then they apply for the lotteries for one of the few great schools that we have in the district, and they don't get in. And then they come to me and they say, now what? And if I can't provide that family with a space in a traditional public school that I would send my own kids to, then who am I to deny them a $7,500 voucher, which is, by the way, less money than we spend per child, to go to a Catholic school and get a great education. I'm not, I'm not going to do that, because I would never want anyone to limit my choices as a parent. How am I going to do that over trying to save the district? So I think the bottom line is that, that we have to start thinking about the entire educational system, not about what's good for the system or what's good for the district, but what is good for kids. Because if you look at it from that perspective, Right? The one I just described. There's no way that you would ever be able to say it's good for that child not to get a voucher. It might be better for the system, not good for the child. Doing things that are good for the system, this is where it's gotten us over the last 30 years in this country? Nowhere. 
So let's try to shift our focus to the kids and see how we can then work together in a bipartisan way, right? I don't want to be the only Democrat out there. I know I'm not. Uh, that, 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 that supporting voucher, let, let's, if we start to think about it as pro-kid, putting children first, then, then we can start, that, that, then I think that that is going to create the right dynamic. Let me be clear that I don't think that charters and vouchers alone are the answer. Those two things together cannot solve the problem. You have to have a strong traditional public education system as well. My only argument is that the, the traditional public school system has, I think, the incentive and the leverage to become better when you've got these other sectors at play as well. Thank you. I just noticed the Senate only has one button. They don't trust you with more than, than, than one button. I was just curious about that. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for coming in. I, during lunch and then uh, now, uh, you've given us some great information. You had mentioned you're a Democrat. I'm Republican, but I don't think this is. I think this is bipartisan. It is a. It is all about the, the kids, yep. and that we've been entrusted in our educational system to. Uh, to get them to a level where they can be productive. Um, I, I, I would like, since you have been in Washington, you have been a superintendent, you've been in the school system, um, we talk a great deal about how either functional or dysfunctional the system is because of all the bureaucracy. Uh, starting in Washington and coming here to the states and then ultimately going to the to the system itself. Could you speak to how you think this is beneficial or do you think that the way our system is set up right now uh, may need to be uh, tweaked a bit to help our local systems actually uh, educate our children? Yeah. Uh, well, there's there, there are lots of different levels. Uh, that 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 you're talking about, and so it'll sort of be difficult to hit on all of them. But let me just say this: I don't believe in a a completely local system, right? Let every local decide for themselves, and that's because that's essentially, in large part, what we have now. The, we've got you know thousands of, of of school districts across the country, each deciding their own curriculum, each making their own policy decisions, et cetera. It's that's not a workable situation, particularly given how political things like school board are. Um, so I do think that there is a need for the depart a strong Department of Education uh, to, 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 to create a very clear accountability system. That, I think, is important. I think the move towards a common core standards and assessment is very important because we don't need 50 sets of standards in this country. We need to have one internationally benchmark set of standards because, again, we're not competing with one another. We're competing with, with India and China, right? So the, I, I think there is a, the, the need for a strong Department of Education. Uh, I think that, though, part of the reason why we're in the position that we are now is because of bureaucracies. We've created these incredible bureaucracies and these systems that make absolutely no sense. One of the things I did in D.C., which used to drive the people crazy, is I used to talk directly to teachers, talk directly to parents, and I'd say, if you have any problems with anything, email me. So I'd get teachers who say, could you please send me some markers and some, and I'm saying, we spend $9,000 per child at least on the minimum. You, when you add everything in, it's $14,000. But why, did these, why does this lady need paper and markers? Right? So I would send her some paper and marker, and, and it would drive people nuts because they would say, nah, she's not allowed, she can only talk to her principal, and the principal can only talk to the instructional superintendent, and the instructional superintendent can only talk to this person. Nobody's allowed to talk to her, and I, I flattened that organization with a quickness. And you know what I realized through that? Is that by flattening the system and hearing directly from, from, from people who were in the trenches what were going on, I knew all of the craziness that was happening. We were creating all these rules and got to come to the training and got to fill out the form. And this was taking up so much of the principals and educators' time that they, could, they couldn't actually focus on the thing that we wanted to, which was what's happening with instruction in the classroom. So I said, look, if the, if the, if the school is meeting a certain target on attendance, then don't make them come to the attendance conference. That's a waste of time. Set, set the clear expectations about what you want to see and then give people the flexibility, especially if they're meeting those goals, to be able to, to use the time in the way that, because they, they know better than us on that. We as the bureaucrats don't decide that better, better than, the, the, than the locals do. So I think it's a mix, it's a balance. Yeah. 
Yes, uh, thank you for coming today. Can Dr. be used in such a way as not to draw down on the per capita funding in the public schools? Well, I mean, I th there, there are lots of different ways that, that voucher programs are being structured uh, across the country. I think we're just sort of at, at a place right now where we're seeing what works through, uh, through tax credits, et cetera. Um, and then we talked a little bit about internationally, there are different uh, countries who are, who are moving towards you know, full voucher systems, and, and I think it's important for us as a country to see how those work. Um, you know, the, the reality that we're in right now, I think this is to your point, is that because we we are strapped financially. There, there's not, there aren't a lot of opportunities uh, in this space. So that's why we, I, I'm in favor of focusing any kind of voucher programs on low-income families who otherwise wouldn't have any choices. Um, as you think about sort of the system as a whole and how you, uh, you know, don't, don't rely on sort of a government-run monopoly and that sort of thing, what the options are, I think we have to think carefully about how you can structure those things so that financially sustainable and doable for a state to actually implement. Um, and I don't, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't profess to be the expert on that, but what I would say is that we have to aggressively be looking at how all those structures might work because, because um, you know, this is, a, this is a, people don't like to sort of talk about this, but this is a business, right? We spend a whole lot of money in education and a whole lot of people make money off of off of the, this education system, and so you know, moving that money around and tweaking it in any way is going to cause a, a lot of people to become unhappy. So we have to think carefully about how those structures can be put in place. Yes. What do you think about non-educators making business people as administrators in our school systems? So, um, the, in terms of, of trusting non-educators to become administrators, um, some of my closest friends, my mentor Joel Klein, you know, was a, a, a corporate attorney. He was he worked for the Clinton White House, uh, and then he ran New York State Public Schools, and I think did an extraordinary job. Um, I think what's harder is when you get to the building level. Can you bring non-educators in to be principals? The issue there is that the, the way that our structures are set up right now, there's an expectation that the principal is going to also be the instructional leader in the school. So unless you have some expertise in that area. Now, I've heard some school districts talk about, well, in a school, a school, an individual school, you could have a chief academic officer, you could have an operations component, you could potentially do it like and then you could have, you know, a non-educator become sort of more the CEO of the school model. Uh, but I, I haven't seen any that works. So I think it depends on the level uh, that you're talking about. Uh, in terms of whether we trust children, I trust kids more than anyone else in this whole thing. The kids will tell you very, in a very straight manner exactly what is going on in school. When I used to visit schools in D.C., I never used to go to the front office. I'd just go into classrooms, and I'd look for the kid who looks the most disengaged, and I'd ask him, what's going on in the school? And they can very quickly, these, these five teachers are great, these ones not so much. If you did this, this, and this, it would totally change. They, they can tell you very clearly. So uh, I, I trust kids. Now, in terms of pathways programs and career and technical education programs, here's what I think is the key. And if you, if you stick by this, then I think that, that the other th problems will solve themselves. I think our goal has to be to graduate children from high school who have options. Thank you. They have the option to attend a four-year college yeah. if they choose to go that Thank route, you. and they can do so without remediation. Or they have the option to go straight into the workforce, and they have the skills and knowledge necessary to get a job mm -hmm. that is well-paying enough to support a family. So options is the most important thing. Now, in order to ensure that you're graduating kids with options, that means you can't just put them on a track that doesn't allow them, if they decide at the 12th grade that they want to go to college, that they don't have then the coursework to be able to do that. And the best CTE programs do both. You have a rigorous college-going curriculum, and then you also simultaneously have the career-building skills so that they, they can go either way. Okay, Alicia, from one Democrat to another. Go ahead. 
Representative Morgan. One proud Democrat to another. <laughs> um, thank you again for being here. I have two quick questions. One is how you define success uh, based on what's happening in D.C. and the reforms that you were able to pass while you were there. And secondly, if you could talk about the parent trigger law sure. in California. There's a couple of folks here who are considering uh, some legislation around that. If you could talk about why you might support that and, and how you think the most effective law could work for parents and kids. Yeah. So uh, on the first, success for me is student achievement. Our student achievement level is going up. I remember um, uh, about 18 months into my tenure in D.C., I was having a conversation with one of these policy wonk people, and they said, even if you don't do anything else, you have done so much for the movement, it would be, you know, it's wonderful. And I looked at him and I said, that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. I'm not here to, to, to shake things up and to break China. I'm doing these things because we believe that it's going to result in better student outcomes. And if at the end of the day it doesn't, produce higher achievement levels, they won't, won't have been worth it in the end. Uh, and so for the people who want to look at the systems and say, well, we've made these kinds of improvements to the system, but they're not actually correlating it to student achievement in the end, I think are, are off. So the success all has to be about that. Um, in terms of the parent trigger, uh, so for those of you who are not familiar, California recently passed a, a very, very uh, innovative law that basically that if more than 50 percent of the parents in, in a school sign a petition, that they can trigger the restructuring of a school. So, and they are allowed to choose what the restructuring is. So in California, they are allowed to say, we want to turn it into a charter school, and here's the charter provider that we want to do the work. And the school system is required to move forward with the wishes of the families as long as they, they can't show that it's impossible to do. Which, you know. So they have to show there's a very high burden of proof to do what the parents want. Uh, now, there are a few things that are going on right now that I call parent trigger light. Right? So there's, there's some bills that are out there that says, well, 51% of the parents and the staff, well, these are the people who are working in the schools who aren't doing a particularly great job to begin with. Are you going to get 50% of them to say, yeah, we should go somewhere else? Not like, so we, we are in favor of parents or, or teachers, but not necessarily that it has to be both. Uh, so that's one thing. And then we do think that it's incredibly important if, if, um, that, that, the, that the decision of what happens in that school doesn't sit necessarily with the school district, because the school district is running this mammoth bureaucracy, right? And they might not choose the things that are going to ultimately really uh, restructure the school and turn it around. Um, so th those, I think, are the two important pieces to be mindful of. Representative Crawford? Is that your button? Who's got, who's got 65? Okay. Well, you got to get on the road. Yeah, Michelle, we, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts. Uh, and I, I know we look forward to hearing further great things about you. Uh, and we wish you got feedback to Washington, as you and I are two of the Washington Redskin fans in this group. <laughs> And uh, with that, we're adjourned, except the House will reconvene in here in 10 minutes for their remedial committee meeting. <laughs>
testing. All right, can I have everyone on the Education Committee come in and take a seat, please? We're going to get started. I hope I have, well, I have a quorum. All the Education Committee, come in and sit down, please. I want to be sure I got a quorum to get started. Is Howard Maxwell here? Is Howard Maxwell here? Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Yeah, your bill. We're taking up your bill. For, uh, good gosh. I, uh, I want to be sure. Be, Howard, 130. All right. All right. If I could get someone to close the door, please. Do I have a quorum? How many? Do I have a quorum? One, one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, we got a quorum. All right, if I could ask you to please take your conversations outside. Please take your conversations outside. All right, I would call the meeting to order. That was quite an interesting, interesting meeting. I don't know about y'all, it's really a lot of good thought. Uh, uh, we have a lone Democrat up here that said she wanted you to take that. <laughs> okay, uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to... Uh, Paul, would you mind doing a prayer? I'd like to call on Paul, if he would, to open my meeting with prayer, please. What's your number? This is RTX. <laughs> oh, what's your number? What? <laughs> number seven. Got you. Right, go ahead. Okay. Let's bow. Father, we, uh, we thank you for our opportunities of uh, service. Uh, and the time we've had al already to spend talking about uh, the greatest gifts that uh, you have given to us and responsibilities, and that is the children that uh, are part of Georgia. And uh, help us to do the right thing. Help us always to keep in mind that uh, they are the future, and uh, uh, we want to do the very best that we can to give them the best education possible. So bless our time together. And we will thank you and praise you for it all. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. All right. Now we have two or three things we need to do today. First of all, I want to... Uh, uh, sign, uh, David's not here. I think he's ill. But I want to sign some bills to subcommittees and uh, let the chairs know that I think we need to go ahead and have, start having some hearings because we have got a, have a lot of legislation out there and we need to bring it to the forefront. Who is the vice chair for David Cassis's committee? All right, so be sure you take the, the information we're giving there. Now, Janet, if you and uh, Abby will help me out, be sure I sign these. First of all, we have House Bill 172. That's a House Bill. Now, this one, listen to this. It, what we did in the past, we said uh, the year 2000, uh, that 13, that all schools had to choose either to become I square or charter systems or stay as they are. Now, what's going on? We know that we have a QBE study commission going. We also have a race to the top study going. We have a lot going on. And uh, plus, there's a lot of flexibility that's been granted out there. So what we're going to do in this bill, this bill is combining all the flexibility we have, and it's extending that date just to 2015. Hopefully by that time we'll have the QBE study done, we'll have the race to the top done, we'll have some recommendations, and we'll be able to go with it. So that'll give the schools more time to prepare and be ready. And I, I have heard no one that was object to this. I've talked to all the organizations and different groups, and they seem to think it's good. So that one, I'm assigning that one to uh, academic uh, support. All right, where's that? That's in yours, I think. That's yours, all right? The next one we have is House Bill 173. Again, this one is a professional standards housekeeping uh, piece of legislation, just uh, taking care of that, so that's also academic support. The next one is a one that's a House Bill 175, 
And uh, that's an online clearinghouse. This act is a clearinghouse through which local school systems may offer computer-based courses to students of both other local systems. That's a curriculum issue, so that's going to academic, um, academic achievement. Uh, the next one, 181 House bill, is uh, allowing, it's in severe cases where a child of a special needs student is uh, not able to enroll that child because it could cause some severe problems like allergies or something that they, they I'm not really sure all the things it could be, but it's to look at the special needs scholarship. I'm assigning that one also to academic. No, that's going to be academic achievement because it is, uh, all right. Uh, the next one is House Bill 186. That is uh, related to the, that was a study commission we did all summer that Randy chaired along with Steve Davis. They did a lot of work looking at the math curriculum, looking at technical education, looking at dual enrollment and all facets of that. And we're assigning that one to academic achievement also. Uh, the next one is the QBE study commission. Uh, that one is uh, going to be assigned to academic uh, achievement also, and that's to look at the QBE, that's the study commission to examine that. That is House Bill 192. Now, Jen, I think, Abby, that took them all. Is that all of them? Did I get them all? All I'm assigned. Because David's not here, so I hope I just picked this up. 175, that was in academic um, achievement. All right. Did I miss, did I get them all? I think I did, okay? All right. Now, I would like to ask if you would, if you would tell David I'd like a meeting set up next week. Yeah. 171. 171? Yeah. All right. House Bill 171. I didn't realize that one hadn't been assigned. That's the Higher Ed Scholarship. And what this one does, let me be sure I look at House Bill 171 to be sure I have this. Uh, what that one does, it allow, in a school act, a student that graduates before the 12th grade and passes all state required assessment tests and she'll be granted, it allows that student to move on into college and what it does, it allows that child's no longer at the high school, it allows that child to keep half of that state allotment at the high school and the other half would go with the child to college as a scholarship. So we'll, we'll have more discussion on that later. I'm on We'll give that one to you. Ed says, so that's a real creative, innovative project. I'm going to let you have that one because I know you'll give it a good study, so that's in your subcommittee. Keep everybody going. I'd like to ask the subcommittee chairs to please set up some meetings next week. I'd like these, these bills moved as quickly as possible. So uh, if you'll talk to David and, and Randy and, and Ed, if y'all go ahead and set up a time y'all want to meet, and uh, we'll go from there. And uh, any other questions about bills? All right. Any other housekeeping? Remember your dues, $25. Janet, I think most of them have paid, haven't they? Uh, where's Tommy? Tommy, if they'll get to you and give him that. That's for our flower fund and for other things we have. I have a question. What's your mic number? Say it again. Yes. Yes, I love, I'm going to have sent to you what Abby has done. That'll be sent to you where you'll have that. What subcommittee? Now, that's been given to you, so I hope you have that. We, if you look in your folders, do they have their folders, Janet? No. Do they have their folders? No. Where are their folders? No. They're not here? No. Do we have copies of the bill we're going to take up today? No. But, okay, your folders would be, but uh, your subcommittees are also posted in my office by the door, and they're in your folder, what subcommittees you're on. If you don't know, uh, see Janet afterwards, and she can give you that now. Okay. Any other questions? All right. This time we're going to remember David assigned one bill to the full committee. We felt like it was just uh, it, it could just move right on through because the author is so good and so slick and could just move it right on through. So at this time I'd like to ask Representative Maxwell if he'd come to the podium up here and present House Bill 130. Do they all have copies of that? Yes. Okay. So call me slick, huh? <laughs> This is a simple little bill here. It does two things. 
It's going to repeal the sunset date currently December 31st, 2012 of the Career and Technical Education Advisory Commission and limits the number of commission meetings per year to at least one meeting. Uh, concurrently, the legislation was passed in 06. It had a sunset date in here of December 31st, 2012, and it said the commission should not meet more than two, uh, not meet less than two times, no more than four times annually. We've met no more than one time per year. Uh, but we found this to be probably a pretty good little committee that uh, works with our Senate counterparts, works with the uh, Department of Education, the career and technical uh, personnel, and uh, we've been trying to work uh, pretty hard in, in trying to get uh, dual enrollment back going in our schools. Actually, we passed the term dual enrollment. We're trying to go to the dual credits. I don't care where they're dual enrolled. I don't, we, we really don't care where the students are enrolled. All we want is to make sure when they're uh, in our technical school, in our high school, that they're getting dual credits so when they graduate uh, from high school they've got some uh, technical college behind them. And, and try to get away from this fallacy that we've been living under that uh, all kids are, need to go to a four-year college. So that's my editorial comment. Mr. Right, do you have any Chairman. questions for Representative Maxwell? All right. Anybody have a question? Raise your hand. All right. So I assume you're ready to vote. All in favor of the bill, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Unanimous. Uh, Representative Maxwell, you'll be moved to rules and you can do it. now. Is there anyone who has anything they'd like to say before we adjourn? This is a good meeting. Janet, our next meeting is next Thursday. We've moved back to that at 3 o'clock, room 506. And hopefully at that time, I will have some bills referred from the subcommittees. By that time, yes, you, which, give me, all right. You're on. Do you have an issue if we try to schedule, um, would you like to try to schedule the subcommittee here in the early next week? I know we're not going until Tuesday. I know we've got some availability Mondays to know to push. Um, are you bad enough to move these bills? Now, you do know we will not give any extra days. They're not paid for that day because it's not between a day. But, it, you know, but so that, so they'd be, I'd rather you do it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or even, you know, whatever. But if you can't, hey, let's put it this way. When we get down to the push and shove, we'll do some of that. But uh, as of right now, uh, I was just asking about that. You get to me. If you need it, call me and I'll, I'll okay it if you need to. Let me know and I'll okay it for you, okay, if I need to. All right, anybody else have a question? Yes. I was going to tell you, if anybody wants to meet before the Education Committee, if any subcommittees want to meet before, that room's open beforehand. So if you want to do a couple out, if you want to do an hour one or do, just split them up in half an hour and do a couple bills in those. That's you know, a good point. A 506 is available an hour earlier. Yeah, you so you can get it at 2 o'clock to use it because I have it reserved. Actually, we have them too. Two to five, don't we? No, you have, three, you have three to five. Three to five, but we can get it. Abby will take care of it. She runs that. She runs it. And Wednesday, if you want to, let her know. Right? Remember Wednesday, we have that meeting in Horrible. Well, I mean, but we can get other, other little conferences. We can try. Yeah. Try to get you something else. This lady will work miracles for us. I'm, I hate to put on pressure, like put her on a spot like that, but she'll work. And again, do you have anything, Betsy, you need? Are they overwhelming you with legislation? And I have a feeling. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now listen to this. Listen to this now. This is not required. There is a Microsoft lunching meeting, joint House and Senate. They've invited us to come, see what they have to offer. Where is it? 403. 403 Wednesday, 12 o'clock, or upon adjournment. We'd like to invite you all. I think you'd love to come and see this and see what they have to offer. I think it'd be very interesting for you, but it's not required, so don't think we've required that. It's open to everyone, so if you'd like to come. There'd be a lunch, a luncheon meeting. They are providing lunch. All right, just RSVP to Jan if you're coming where we'll know that. Now, is there any, do we have anyone in the audience, this is your first time visiting with us, a student, our teacher, administrator, please stand up. Anyone in the back that's your first time with us, please stand up and let us meet you. All right, the rest, you're all part of us then. We thank you. Anybody have anything they'd like to add or say to this meeting about this? I think we've had a good day. We've learned a lot, and I appreciate you coming. We stand adjourned. Thank you.